uh, you know, the aptitude tests have probably done some harm in terms of moving us forward to say, well, you know, you either have musical talent or you don't, you can't develop it. If we believe in music for all people and all students, then that's a detriment. That's today's guest, researcher, author, and professor Glenn Nearman, reminding us that making music is for everyone. Welcome to Music Get Insights. I'm Alan Fire here with Steve Shanley. Each episode, Alan and I talk with national thought leaders in music education with practical insights for K-12 music educators. Steve, tell us about today's guest. Glenn Nearman has recently retired from a distinguished career as professor of music education and associate director of the School of Music at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Dr. Nearman is a past president of the National Association for Music Education and a member of the board of directors of the International Society of Music Education. His research interests are in the areas of assessment, teacher education, and instructional strategies, and he has authored numerous journal articles and given conference presentations and addresses on five continents. Find Glenn's full bio, show notes, and resources at www.musicedinsights.com. What was a high point for you in this interview, Alan? I really liked his simple yet effective way that students can use their own devices for assessment, even in the midst of group rehearsals. Listen for details on that and check out the download on our site. What about you, Steve? Well, I scheduled this episode during summer break on purpose because when we're in the thick of the school year, it's tough to motivate ourselves to think about a topic like assessment sometimes. But I encourage listeners to check out this episode over the summer and think about how they might implement some of Dr. Nearman's simple suggestions. I like how he reminds us that the concert performance in and of itself does not give us the info we need. We must take into account the growth and where students started. Yes. The best assessment is formative, not summative. It's all about helping students grow. Let's get to this conversation. Glenn Nearman, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here. Well, you are an expert in the area of assessment, which is admittedly something we haven't discussed much on our podcast so far. So let's start with your general take on assessment in K-12 music education. Do you think there are some aspects of assessment that as a profession we're doing generally well or generally not as well? What's the overall landscape look like to you right now? Certainly one that I think we do pretty well on is that good assessment occurs in authentic context. In other words, we don't just ask students to define a major scale, but can they distinguish uh, in listening a major from a minor scale? And can they play such a thing? So they're actually doing and making music. And we do a pretty good job of, of that. There are some other characteristics like assessing for transfer. I'm not sure we always do that very well, although a number of our folks do sight reading a lot in their rehearsals. And that certainly uh, helps with transfer. That's a good thing. Some things that maybe are not going so well, I would say, have to do with assessment as being for the group assessment as a compared to individual set assessment. Assessment, I think, should be all about the individual's musical growth. And in a number of states, in fact, they've even changed the name of their contests and festivals to say things like instrumental group assessments or jazz ensemble assessments and so forth. I'm a little concerned about that because uh, at the end of the day, we ought to be able to tell that learner, give that learner feedback about their own personal musical growth. One other, couple other concerns. One, I'm concerned that assessment is really still very product oriented and not so process oriented, like our new revised music standards try to get us to think about process orientation. And we're still pretty much product oriented in terms of our assessments. So that's, that's a problem. And I think some of our teachers have a problem with integrating assessment into rehearsals and typical music lessons. Now, I think our general music folks at the uh, pre-K through six level probably do a better job here than uh, I was a former high school band director than do our, we secondary band directors here, because we always think there's not enough time to really do this well and to integrate it uh, into what we teach. And then finally, I would say that there aren't many standardized assessment tools published anymore. You can't go down to the local music store like we used to and buy a copy of the Watkins Foreign Performance Scale, for example. Some of Ed Gordon's stuff is still available, and that's good, but uh, uh, a lot of that depends on utilizing and knowing his system pretty well. That would be some of my ideas about where we are in assessment today. 
I'd like to talk a little bit about those Edwin Gordon tests. Do you find those music aptitude tests still useful? I mean, if it's our job to provide a music education for all students, regardless of their ability, why would it be necessary to identify those with high or low aptitude? And, and I say this because 30 years ago, I, I feel like those were sometimes used as a way to say, oh, I don't know if band is going to be a good thing for you or not. So is it possible to use those in a way and still maintain this philosophy that music education for all students is a good thing? Oh, that's a great question, Steve. Yes, I agree with you. You know, people got the idea that they could give the uh, music aptitude profile and then say, well, okay, this person is better suited for French horn or this person is better suited for something else. And, and those Tests never had that kind of power. Uh, certainly some of the other ones that were used at that time, like the Con selmer test. I mean, the Con selmer test, purpose of that test was to sell instruments and everybody did pretty well. So you didn't know <laughs> a lot about what that student could do musically after the test was given. Of course, aptitude has to do with one's capability to learn. And I think we carried a lot of negative baggage from the beginnings of, of aptitude testing really in the 1920s. And we got this connection between aptitude and characteristics that are inherited. And so it wasn't possible, said some people, to develop your musical aptitude. And Gordon tried to get us away from that thinking. And I think now we're, we're moving more toward the idea that that music aptitude or capability is a combination really of a nature nurture controversy. What is inherited and what is learned? And it takes some of both of those factors in order to make aptitude a, a meaningful concept. One of my good friends, uh, who's also about to retire down at the University of Florida, Dr. Tim Brophy, now, he did a book in uh, the early part of this 21st century entitled Assessing the Developing Child Musician. And he talked about four enabling competencies. He got away from the baggage of that term aptitude. And uh, he talked about enabling competencies like beat competency, the ability to keep a steady beat and imitation or echo competency and so forth. And I really think this is a fine concept to talk about what are the enabling competencies that will allow us to progress more quickly and more efficiently in our musical growth. We take that information and use it in a diagnostic way to help us promote the musical growth of those learners. And if we do that, I think music aptitude is certainly a useful concept. Back to Dr. Brophy's research. I really like that language of competencies, especially as the rest of the subjects are moving into a standards-based grading approach. That language makes it sound much more like you might not be at this place right now for pulse matching, but you can be. <laughs> but you yes. don't have that competency developed yet, but we can get you there. Whereas aptitude or ability kind of makes it sound a little more like, if you don't have that, then I'm sorry, kid, you're just going to find this difficult. I, I assume that was deliberate on his part. Yes, I think so. You've said so much that there are so many directions we could go here, but I really want to go back to this. You talked about nature versus nurture, and I think you implied or said that there's value in knowing which was which. And from a practical standpoint, my challenge is why? Why do we need to differentiate between nature versus nurture if assessment tools are, are developmental and not summative and they're, we're using them to help promote musical growth? It, does it, is it helpful to know what the nature is, or should we just worry about nurture? Because that's where we're at with them. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to imply that, that, that it's really important to know. The important thing to remember here is that we have moved forward in our understanding here and know that some of these basic aptitudes can be developed. Some of the research has shown that, I, I call it the window of opportunity, that the window of opportunity is open wider for those people who are younger birth to some say age nine or 10. I kind of believe that's true, but that doesn't mean that those who are past that age can't continue to grow and develop in their, in their aptitude. And that's, I think, what we've learned. I think back to the language component of it, I wonder if the aptitude tests and the, the decades that those were in use have contributed to this culture that we still have of 
you run into someone and Glenn, I'm sure this has happened to you. They ask you what you do and you say, I teach music and they say, oh, I'm not a music person. Yeah. And that just breaks my heart. And I'm trying to figure out how we fix that because everybody can be a music person and you don't meet someone who if you said well, i teach english they might say oh you know i struggled but they don't say oh I, I i'm not a reading person and my hope is that as we focus more on changing the language around ability or an innate ability that we can help a new generation of people realize that we can all enjoy reading at different levels we might comprehend at different levels but music is is the same way and we can enjoy it even if we don't perform it yeah well, i agree with you that uh, you know the aptitude tests have probably done some harm in terms of moving us forward to say well you know you either have musical talent or you don't you can't develop it if we believe in music for all people and all students then that's a detriment so our focus on this podcast is to give our teachers some things that they can go into the classroom tomorrow and make some improvements, make some changes. Back to your earlier comment about the large group and we're a band director, a choir director, or orchestra in front of a 40 piece group or an 80 piece group. And you talked about differentiating between the full group uh, progress versus individual progress. And in my experience, the teacher who has, we'll just call it the best ears, very good ears, can make a lot of those determinations about how individuals are doing. Right. Let's not worry about them for a second. What are some things that someone who oral skills was not their thing in college, but they want to do a better job with this? Do you have some ideas for how they can work with the individual and in states you know, in Iowa, we're lucky. A lot of us get to teach private lessons to our students so we can take care of it there. But as you know, most states not like that. I got to imagine over the years, you've come up with a few starting places for people who maybe their oral skills aren't the greatest, but they want to work on the assessment. Yes, we've had uh, the ability to do tape recordings for a number of years now. And uh, I don't think our teachers utilize that as much as they really could. Uh, I'm always interested in Assessment, I usually define it in terms of growth. What kind of progress have you made from point A to point B? The recording shouldn't just be, you know, let's uh, listen to the recording of the, of the concert and so forth, but let's use it on a almost a daily basis. And can we use our ears to listen and hear that we have progressed in the making of music? So that's one thing I think that that's really important. Are you suggesting that we record students individually? Will we have a chance to hear them individually? Can we keep those on record? And then and then record a student playing the same thing a week or two later and then have them listen back to back and sit down and assess together. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yes. And I think we have some tools now, certainly with our individual cell phones and things of that sort. We can make those recordings so we can hear the individual, we can hear the group in the background, but hear that individual singing and make comments and help that person in terms of assessment. Sometimes they're really reluctant to play or sing alone. And then there's some other tools that we've had for a long time. I used to use some alliteration and talk about three factors. One was the simple rating scale, define the endpoints, and then uh, use a five point or a seven point rating scale. You can assess pretty quickly and give feedback using that on intonation or phrasing or whatever, maybe even leave a line for comment. Then uh, the other one, of course, it's been very popular recently are rubrics. You know, rubrics have become a term that we use kind of like we use uh, Kleenex or Xerox copies. When we say that, you know, we want to use a, a, a tissue, for example, we often say, well, I want to use a Kleenex. Well, it might be a puffs or it might be whatever else. We've sort of come to that same kind of understanding with a rubric too. Well, anything that has to do assessment has to be a rubric. And so sometimes you'll see the differentiations of levels in a rubric be something like perform this phrase with one rhythmic air. And the next level is with two or three. Well, that's nothing more than a rating scale. And so I try to teach about a rubric being a qualitative assessment tool, meaning that it is a verbal picture, a verbal snapshot of what that student is or should be sounding or doing like in making music at a certain level. And it is based on a verbal description. And you can't do that in one or two words. You know, you have to maybe write two or three sentences and it should be a holistic assessment. So I'm not sure everybody's using rubrics to their full advantage. 
I have used rubric like Kleenex as well. This is going to be something I need to reevaluate myself. Uh, and I think you're right. Widespread, unintentional misuse of the word, which in and of itself, I don't think is, you know, a crime. But when I hear you discuss what it is, I feel like the, the crime is we're missing out on another way of presenting or getting information, giving information to our students or uh, accumulating it for ourselves. Steve, that's very well said. The point you made about missing out on another way of doing this besides just using numbers, that's the crux of the matter. And I'd like to go back to the recording. I think we, we know as large ensemble directors that we should be recording our groups because we can listen and not be worried about classroom management or any of the other things. We can listen as many times as we want, follow along in the score and so on. And I think a lot of people know about that, but what you described, hey, everybody get your phone out and we're going to play from letter A to letter B and just have the phone near you and record you and you're going to send that to me. Alan, have you heard of that tactic before? Nope. And it's dirt simple. Like I want to do it tomorrow and I don't teach band anymore. <laughs> What that does, well, first of all, we all know that the second you tell the students to get their phone out, they're recording themselves and they're going to play from letter A to letter B. That's probably the best letter A to letter B is ever going to have sounded because everybody's going to be fully invested. The other thing I, I love about this, Glenn, you mentioned that students do not like singing or performing by themselves sometimes. And the smart music where we send the student home and they're in their bedroom and they have to play by themselves, even with no audience, that is nerve wracking for some students. And, you know, all of us were like, well, I can, you know, I can play it fine when I'm in the group or I can sing it fine when I'm in the group. That at least gives the student the opportunity to be assessed with the rest of the group and with that help. I have not heard of that and it doesn't seem like it would be a challenging thing to do. And like you said, it could just be a couple of measures. And I see so many great things that could come from that. Yeah, well, and you're not doing that exercise for a polished recording of anything. It's for assessment purposes. And I, I think it's a viable tool. I've had teachers use it with a good deal of success. Also easy enough to say we're going to record from letter A to letter B, and before tomorrow, you listen to yourself and send me a, your assessment of where you think you are. Exactly. Right. That's one of those things that would require no work on the teacher's part, but probably get them some information and have the students do some self-assessing. And, and I like that as opposed to listen to the whole group or watch this video of the marching band performance from Friday night and figure out where you are and how you can improve. This is uh, great. Some really good ideas there. Yeah. Before we leave the assessment discussion, our general music teachers, our K-6 general music teachers, we have found are typically doing a way better job <laughs> of pretty much all types of music education, teaching every single student in the school, uh, measurement, assessment, variety, world music. I mean, they put the secondary, us secondary ensemble teachers to shame. That being said, are there some things before we leave this that you have noticed with the general music that you think we could be doing this a little bit better too? They're doing a better job than our, than our high school, middle school band choir orchestra teachers, but they, here's, here's some room for improvement with our general music and our elementary students. Yeah. Well, that idea of integrating the assessment into the lesson, and you're not doing this thing of, you know, teach, 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 teach a certain number of days, and then all of a sudden we're going to take a couple of days out for testing, and then teach, teach, teach some more. It's, it's integrated in there, and I've seen so many good uh, examples at the elementary general music level. For example, I remember one of my, again, one of my good cooperating teachers presented a different session with me on, on an international music assessment symposium. And uh, she was showing this idea of the enabling factor of keeping a steady beat, for example. She would use a song that they knew pretty well, and they sort of played a game with bouncing the ball to the beat of the song around in a circle. So they were participating and doing this activity. At the same time, she was assessing who could keep that ball going, and it was all happening. The learning and the assessment were integrated into one package. It's not easy. But that's the way I think we need to be thinking. And then those students won't fear assessment so much. They'll look at it as a, as a natural part of learning. So you're about to retire from a 
a distinguished and and with all due respect lengthy career <laughs> what are what are some of the most significant changes either positive or negative you've seen in music education over the last half century well okay i was raised as as a really elementary middle school and high school student with a great teacher in a small school uh who at those times in the in the 60s uh was talking about uh, uh, comprehensive musicianship. Now, he didn't call it that with us, but I, I soon learned what he was doing when I myself began my training uh, to be a music teacher. And, and I think hopefully we're getting away from this idea that music is just about playing the music or singing the music, but that, you know, we also understand something about what we are doing and we can put it into context of what else was going on in the world at the time this music was written and so forth. And so I think uh, from the 60s, our movement and, and 70s, uh, where we talked a lot about comprehensive musicianship, and now this movement toward the new standards in 2014 and 2015, which are process oriented, I think it's all part of that same general movement toward comprehensiveness or total musicianships. The idea that musical literacy is more than just being able to read the notes on the page, but it's being able to, to be able to compose and to perform, to be able to respond to music and to make connections. All of that's important in what I call the idea of new music literacy. I think the use of technology in the classroom, you, I think Steve mentioned smart music before. The, the ability of smart music and the use of other technologies have been a big plus as well. And furthermore, I think we have also moved into a wider variety of genres. All of those are positive things. Uh, negatively, I have to look and say that I I'm concerned about the shortening of the life of teachers in the music classroom in general. Those people who last, you know, 20, 25 years are, are unfortunately few and far between now. I think it has to do with probably the gap that exists between expectations and, and reality of what happens in the music classroom. I'm certainly concerned about that. Uh, the lack of respect for teachers in general, I'm concerned about that. And uh, I also have to say I'm concerned about the lack of music educators wanting to uh, join professional organizations. Back when I started in the profession, I mean, I had people who, who encouraged me to be a part of my state MEA organization and so forth. And that was such an important professional development tool for me all throughout my career, even as a collegiate teacher. And I'm concerned about that lack of wanting to join professional organizations. So those are a few ideas there about significant changes. Let's talk a little about the professional organizations. What's your argument to me if I say, I don't need to join, Glenn. I've got YouTube. I've got webinars. Y yeah, when you started teaching, you couldn't just go look up, here's 10 fixes for bad bassoon embouchure on the internet, and you needed those organizations. Why do I need that today when I can look up everything on my phone or, or go hear Wynton Marsalis teach me about swing style on a jazz at Lincoln Center uh, webinar? Yeah, your point is well taken, and I'm, I'm sure that, that a number of our teachers are thinking exactly that way. An important fact for me is the interaction between people that happen at a state or a national or a, a conference. And it's not just the content of what is taught, but it's the enthusiasm and it's the feeling that you get that I can overcome this, I can do this, and I don't get that same motivation often from a recording as opposed to attending a workshop where I'm sitting there with other teachers, some who may be struggling just like me. And that person comes over and say, Hey, have you thought about doing it this way? And, you know, it just isn't the same to me, you know, those in-person professional development opportunities and what we were able to do via YouTube or via zoom or what, whatever. There are some things that be, can be picked up and learned, but it doesn't motivate me often at the core to change. Well said. Well, Glenn Nearman, thank you so much for joining us today to share your insight on assessment and just a goldmine of information with us today. I think we'll be reaching out to you later in retirement. Hopefully you can uh, make some time for us again, because I just hear so many things today that we could do entire episodes on. I've got a dozen follow-up questions myself. But unfortunately, we are out of time and we want to close down with a lightning round. Can we ask you some lighter questions here to close down? Sure, absolutely. Favorite place to eat in Lincoln, Nebraska? 
there are some good places to eat. Of course, we have uh, good beef and pork around here. Misty's, which is just down a couple blocks from me right here at the School of Music, is a wonderful place for prime rib and good pork chops and things of that sort. And uh, then if I have to think, okay, well, now I might want some dessert as well. I might think about the green gateau, which is just a few more blocks to the uh, south here, where I know I'm going to get that delicious chocolate green gateau cake. Is there a musical artist or a piece of music that you wish more people knew about? Every university has some fine performers and so forth, and they offer free recitals and concerts on campus. And I'm often surprised that more people in the community don't take advantage of that. All right, I have a controversial one, if you're up for it. If the Huskers are not bowl eligible this season... Should Scott Frost get to keep his job? (laughs) Okay. Well, you're really going to put me on the spot now, Steve. Um, You know, uh, uh, of course, we had the legendary coach, uh, Tom Osborne, here for years and years. And and he, by by discipline, was an educational psychologist, actually. That was his discipline. And I think that's the reason he had a lot of success, because he understood how what motivated people and and so forth. And and he often said when we were in the old big eight, uh, he would say, well, the reason Missouri and and K-State and so forth are all down the line is because they're always changing coaches. He said, you got to have people who have some longevity. And that's what I I would say to answer this question. No, uh, I I think Scott Frost needs a little more time. I think he certainly knows what to do. And uh, with all of the changing regulations of the NCAA and so forth and this, these transfer por- portals and now, I mean, I think it's going to take a little bit of time for that to settle. And I think if we change again, uh, we won't make any progress. And finally, if you weren't a musician or teacher, what career do you think you would have had these last 50 years? <laughs> Well, you know, when I was younger, uh, I played basketball in college and went to school on a partial basketball scholarship and so on. I wouldn't be a basketball player because I'm I'm, I'm too short, too slow. I think I I would enjoy being a a baseball player. That may be what I would have done if, uh, if I would have been a musician. Well, Glenn Nearman, thank you so very much for being our guest today. It's been great. It's been my pleasure uh, to talk with you, and and, uh, thank you so much for doing these podcasts, and uh, I appreciate the time this afternoon. You've been listening to Music Ed Insights. Please support this podcast by subscribing, rating, and reviewing it. We want to make this as thoughtful and practical as possible. Please send us your ideas for guests and suggestions for improvement. You can do that through our website, www.musicedinsights.com. You can also reach us on our Facebook page, Music Ed Insights, or via Twitter, at Music Ed Insights. Our website is also the place to find program notes, links, and a one-page download of this episode's key takeaways. That's www.musicedinsights.com. This podcast is sponsored and supported by Normal Design, Winterset Websites, Group Dynamic, and the Co-College Music Education Program. Learn more about them at our website. Let us know if your business or organization would like to join that list. New episodes drop every two weeks on Monday mornings. Get current. Stay relevant. Music Ed Insights.